five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. Hey space enthusiasts, I'm super excited about this episode. Avi Loeb is a professor of science at Harvard University and he was the chair of its astronomy department from 2011 to 2020, the longest standing chair. He has written eight books, including the bestseller Extraterrestrial and 800 research papers. Among many other things, he is well known for his views on the Oumuamua interstellar object and he now heads the Galileo project which is looking for further such objects. One of his upcoming projects is an expedition to try to retrieve fragments of another interstellar object from the ocean floor. We also talk about academia, the way science is pursued, and how we can ensure our kids maintain scientific curiosity. I could have probably talked for many hours with Avi, and I hope he will be back, possibly with the results of analyzing an actual interstellar object. For now though, please enjoy this one hour interview with Professor Avi Loeb. My name is Raphael Rodkin and I'm an investor and advisor to space companies. Just as a reminder, this podcast is for informational purposes only and nothing should be taken as investment advice. This podcast is sponsored by Nanoavionics, a satellite manufacturer and mission integrator. Their technologies enable many space companies worldwide to offer services that improve life right here on Earth, such as providing global connectivity, conducting Earth observation, or contributing to scientific discoveries. Check them out and also check out my episode with the CEO and co-founder. Sadly, I am not a rocket scientist, but I'm an alumnus of the International Space University. ISU offers a number of educational programs about space worldwide. Check them out at isunet.edu. And just some final things before we start the episode about ourselves. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as Apple or Spotify. If you want us help expand our work, you can do so and support us at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast. And we'll also put that link in the episode notes. And lastly, you can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. Hello again, space enthusiasts. It's time yet again for another non-business episodes. And long-time listeners know what that means. Basically, I'm not interviewing another CEO of a space company, but somebody else who has very interesting things to say connected to space. And it's my very great pleasure to have as a guest somebody I've been wanting to have for a long time. It's Professor Avi Loeb, who's a professor of science at Harvard University. And also he has been, I think, the longest standing head of the um, astronomy department at Harvard. Right, Avi? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, but you can introduce me as a farm boy. Uh, that pretty much shaped my career more than anything else. The rest is just uh, footnotes. Yes, yes. Well, it's interesting, right? Because I think um, sometimes people forget that people like farm farmers and fishermen actually have a very often a very good intuitive understanding of, of astronomy. Well, um, it's more that I became connected to nature. When I was a kid, I used to every weekend drive to the hills of the village and read philosophy books and uh, be in the company of, of uh, birds uh, and the natural environment rather than people. Uh, and that helps a lot in terms of maintaining your modesty in some sense because you learn things from nature that you didn't expect but also uh, you know <laughs> what I tell young people is uh, if you go to the beach you often uh, see the find the seashells uh, that were swept ashore just a short time ago and mm. each of them looks different you know each of them has its own unique colors and shapes and uh, over time the waves uh, of the ocean rub them against each other and then uh, they break up, lose their color, and become indistinguishable grains of sand. And that's what happens to most people as they age. Uh, and also at a young age, if they interact with each other a lot on social media, they become indistinguishable grains of sand. And we should try to avoid that fate because we should pay attention to what makes us unique and think critically about questions and not subscribe to the herd mentality. I mean, there are advantages to belonging uh, to a big herd because it gives you more power. I mean, that's what you see in the jungle. The animals come together. and But uh, there is a big disadvantage that uh, if the the herd is going in the wrong direction, you know, you want to correct the course. Well, I know I know you were talking mostly sort of on an individual human level, but is there something you think that makes us unique as, as humanity, as human civilization at large? Well, what makes us unique, I mean, it's easy to understand that about 
66 million years ago, there was a giant rock that came from the sky. It was an, an asteroid that hit the Earth, uh, roughly the size of a city like Boston. Mm -hmm. And uh, it basically killed the, the dinosaurs. Now, the dinosaurs were the biggest animals on Earth. And, uh, you know, they felt very proud of themselves because, uh, you know, they could eat the grass. Nobody would threaten their physical uh, dominance. But the only thing that they lacked is intelligence. They did not develop telescopes. They did not expect a risk from the sky. Okay. And we humans, even though we are much smaller animals, uh, we have the human brain, which allows us to be conscious of what's going on and realize that there could be a risk from the sky. And then we develop telescopes that uh, can warn us about the threat from the sky. So if a giant rock of this size would approach the Earth, we would know about it. So we can deflect it with a space mission. And I think that's what makes us, that's an example that illustrates why humans are different. Because once we recognize reality, we can adapt to it and uh, make sure that it doesn't harm us or, or actually take advantage of it. And throughout human history, you see circumstances where humans, you know, used uh, nature to their advantage. But you also see situations where humans were arrogant. They thought that you know, based on their ego, they thought that they play a central role in the universe. And uh, for example, when Galileo Galilei argued, no, it looks to me when I look through my telescope that perhaps the earth is moving around the sun. Uh, the philosophers back then and the theologians uh, disagreed with him. They refused to look through his telescope and they put him in house arrest. And uh, of course, that didn't change anything. Today, they would have canceled him on social media. And uh, if you were to ask those philosophers to design a space mission that would reach Mars, they would never get to the destination because they thought that Mars moves around the Earth. The point is, reality is whatever it is. And if we refuse to recognize it, we will just have the wrong ideas and we won't be able to adapt to it. For example, if we believe uh, in some magical power of COVID-19, then we would never develop the mRNA vaccine and we would never save you know, millions of lives this way. So my point is, science offers a better way, which is to pay attention to evidence. It was really pioneered by Galileo, this, this approach of, you know, being guided by evidence without prejudice. And even the smartest people, like Albert Einstein, can be wrong. Albert Einstein was wrong about three important aspects of modern physics in the last decade of his career. He was arguing that, you know, quantum mechanics has a classical interpretation that mm -hmm. that was completely wrong. Uh, he was arguing that black holes do not exist. He was clearly wrong. And he was arguing that gravitational waves do not exist. Clearly wrong. Mm -hmm. All of that in the last 10 years of his career. And when we say he was wrong, it's simply because we detected these things. There were experiments showing that quantum mechanics is very different from classical physics. There is action at a distance. There were experiments demonstrating the existence of black holes, most recently by imaging a black hole. There were experiments showing that gravitational waves exist. The LIGO experiment detected them. Nobel Prize was awarded for that. Yeah. So we now know that Einstein was wrong. And that's the whole idea of modern science, to be guided by evidence. Unfortunately, even the practitioners of science, even those that on social media ad, uh, advocate and say, we are promoting science, they very, op uh, very often uh, go against collecting evidence, arguing that they know the answer in advance. And that's an oxymoron uh, when you see people doing that. And we can talk about examples. So, yeah, I'm clearly veering off a little bit from my um, sort of uh, laid out questions here about Umur and, and other things. But this is a very interesting topic. So I spent a few minutes on that. So, I mean, you're talking about Einstein. And this is Albert Einstein, right, towards the end of his career. I mean, in this context, does, does like a young sort of new assistant associate professor who's still trying to get <laughs> tenure or even a tenure professor who's still trying to get, get grants, do we even have a chance to go for this kind of uncompromising search for for truth? No, I don't think so. And I hear it from a variety of young scholars. Uh, for example, I had a conference uh, celebrating my 60th birthday that was organized by my students and postdocs. And a few junior faculty uh, that I mentored over the past few decades came to me and said, uh, you know, we're having second thoughts about whether to stay in academia because we don't see that it 
promotes innovation, that uh, you are expected to uh, walk in the beaten path uh, that many others walked through. And you can understand where it's coming from. You know, many senior people over the decades developed their own discipline and uh, ideas about the subject. And in all, they developed an echo chamber so, so that their voice is heard very loud so they want young people to repeat their mantras. They want them to say the same thing so that uh, they will be recognized as important contributors to the field. Their, their status depends on other people saying the same thing. And they want the young people to surrender to whatever they said in the past. And that suppresses innovation. Okay, And it all stems from the ego. The human ego is the source of all evil. And instead, what is supposed to happen is the young people should question the mantras of the senior people, should seek evidence to guide them, because perhaps some of these mantras are wrong. And, you know, we are wasting time in repeating them. And also, it's very boring to keep hearing the same thing over and over again, even if it gives pleasure to those senior people. I mean, we're not supposed to sing their songs. I'm speaking as a young a person with a young attitude, even though I'm 60 years old. But my point of view is, I don't want the young people to repeat my mantras. I want them to examine them critically. I want them to innovate. And unfortunately, that's not the dominant spirit right now in academia. And we can get into examples. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of, I think it was Max Planck who said that science advances one funeral at a time. <laughs> but... <laughs> well, that's too slow. My point is that's too slow. If, yeah. you, look at the, if you look at the tech industry, uh, basically uh, advances in technology like artificial intelligence uh, occur exponentially now on a time scale of a few years. Okay. And imagine if science were doing the same, but it doesn't. It doesn't develop exponentially on a few year time scale it's much slower and it's it develops on the time scale of a human lifetime and i think the reason for that is indeed this inertia that uh, that senior people in, in introduce into the system because of their ego yes so i ask you one final question on this topic which we could spend like hours by itself i think it's a super important topic but any sort of quick thoughts on how we could fix that? I mean, can we fix that within academia or do we just have to look for innovation in other pockets, which are, which may be more, let's call it pragmatic, for example, in, in commerce business where people who want to make money just go wherever the truth leads them or maybe in the milita military domain where people who want to protect national security just go down whatever path they need to and, and don't care whether that's they're going to get canceled by somebody. Well, uh, you know, the situation re reminds me of a society at large. You know, half of the people are women, okay? Mm -hmm. And if you go back in time, uh, you know, the status of women was not equal to that of men and still is not in, in many sectors, okay? And you ask yourself, how is that possible? They're not a minority. They could have had half of the voice, you know, in society. And so I think, you know, over time, things improve. Uh, and... If you think, if you look at the at academia, a substantial portion of the practitioners are young. So it's all a question of the young not surrendering to this mm -hmm. approach and changing the system once they become senior. So, you know, the system can change. It's just a matter of convention. And all these uh, old people, you know, let them leave the scene. And now the younger generation can establish a better system. Uh, and, uh, you know, one thing I noticed from my work is, you know, just uh, a few days ago, I received a million dollars towards an expedition that we can talk about. But <laughs> my point is, there is a huge amount of wealth outside academia, outside the traditional funding agencies like a federal funding funding agency in the US it's a NASA or the National Science Foundation you know over the decades that I practiced astronomy you know I would uh, routinely submit proposals it would take months to write those proposals and then there would be a committee uh, that is populated by mainstream scientists and they would say well let me think about it this is a little bit risky we should not waste taxpayers money on a risky proposition we should find a project that we know the answer in advance for and you know very often it's only those projects that are pretty much uh, predictable that would be funded. And the amount of money is rather minimal. Now, over the past decade, you know, I was funded primarily by the private sector, by 
private donations, by private foundations. And, you know, that is a completely different approach. Um, you know, people that read, read my book, uh, some multi-billionaires came to the porch of my home. They decided to add funds to my uh, research uh, at, at uh, Harvard. And uh, we established the Galileo Project as a result. And now we have an expedition. And it's all because people were inspired by the content of what I write about. And I just, you know, attempted to reach a broader audience, not just appeal to those committees uh, populated by mainstream conservative scientists that want to just maintain the course. And the subject that right now, for example, I'm looking into, you know, is a, of great interest to the public, whether we are alone in the universe, whether there is another intelligence in our mm -hmm. cosmic neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It's of great in, in, uh, interest, and yet it's not funded at all by federal funds. So think about those committees that say, well, it's risky. We don't want to waste taxpayers' money. Well, guess what? If you ask the taxpayers, they will tell you that's the most important question that we care about. How dare you not spend our taxpayers' money on this question? And yet this question is not addressed. So what I'm trying to say is there is a disconnect between what academia is pretending to represent the taxpayers and what the taxpayers really care about. OK, yeah. and nobody on these committees uh, is asking, what do the taxpayers care about? Let's fund those areas, except when you deal with a pandemic that affects everyone. Of course, everyone knows that we should develop uh, the technologies that help society to accommodate, you know, vaccines and so forth. But uh, when you deal with other questions in science, you know, uh, the committees w would fund uh, a search for a specific type of dark matter that you know, at the level of billions of dollars and not find it, whereas the public cares about searching for intelligence in our cosmic neighborhood and no, no money at all would be dedicated for that. And I say, well, there must be a disconnect here. Now, if you go to the wealthy uh, individuals who are attentive uh, to the, the interests of the public, they represent in some sense a, a sub, subset of the public because they many of them acquired their wealth just mm -hmm. recently. It was not inherited. Uh, those are the high-tech uh, people. They really care about science and, you know, they are willing to provide funds. I, I didn't do any fundraising, you see. I didn't go out and beg for money. I didn't have to convince committees. These people read what I wrote and decided to fund it. And I'm saying that's a different path. It sort of opened my eyes to the fact that academia is out of tune with public's interest. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Sometimes I wonder whether there even would be a scope for some sort of, you know, crowdfunding of some of these projects. I mean, people put billions of dollars into, uh, you know, very strange cryptocurrency projects. Why <laughs> maybe it would be possible to fund some something useful as well. Well, uh, th those other projects are have a commercial aspect to them, but what I'm saying is in the context of science, even blue sky research, you know, just to improve our knowledge. Our knowledge is an island in an ocean of ignorance. You know, we know very little, even though scientists very often brag about the little that we know. And if they get a prize, they even brag more about it. Yeah. But my, the point is, we don't know a lot, okay? The more we know, the more we realize how much we don't know. And uh, there is a lot to be learned. And in that context, you know, um, we should represent uh, the interests of most people. And, um, you know, in, in, in the way we invest the funds. And, you know, for some reason, the, for example, the physics and astronomy community uh, went into a direction that they define their own interests as if they represent the public. But if you look at it closely, you realize it doesn't because you have a whole community of theoretical physics that for uh, four decades, four decades, I'm talking about like half a century, there was a whole community of hundreds of Theoretical physicists, you know, they claim they represent the frontiers of theoretical physics, and they went into a direction that has no contact with evidence, no contact with experiments. It's called string theory that is uh, trying to unify uh, quantum mechanics and gravity, but it's just mathematical gymnastics. And you ask yourself, how is that possible? How is that part of the mainstream of theoretical physics when it betrays one of the fundamental principles? Uh, of science that was established by Galileo, which is let's be guided by experiments. How can you say, no, 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 
for half a century, we forget about experiments because it's very difficult and it's not really needed. We are smart enough to figure out the truth. That's a betrayal. That's a re reversal uh, to the psychology of those philosophers that knew the truth in advance without even looking through Galileo's telescope. And what I'm saying is that represents the mainstream of theoretical physics for half a century, half mm. a century. That's a huge amount of time. And you ask, how is that possible? To me, it's possible just because, you know, academia sort of divorced its decision making from the public. Let's, um, you, you mentioned there sort of the public's interest, uh, general interest in, in the question, are we alone? And, and I think that's, that's obviously quite true that uh, this interest exists. You also, also mentioned a few minutes ago, sort of the, the exponential nature of uh, technological development that currently seems to be going on. So if you take this together and if we assume that, you know, sort of the Galilean principle that, that we're not that special and the universe is a very, very large place and a very old place, then, um, you would probably agree that there, there should be other technological advanced civilizations around or at least have been around at some point in time. So I'm just going to ask you about the Fermi paradox. And um, because this is a non-technical podcast, I'm quickly explaining the Fermi paradox. And you can correct me if I'm stating this wrong, which I probably will, is basically saying, well, if there's so many developed civilizations out there, why haven't we heard from one yet? W what is your view on the explanation for the Fermi paradox? Right. So uh, Enrico Fermi, a famous physicist, asked this question during lunchtime at Los Alamos in 1950, about 70 years ago. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, back then... Um, he didn't have any instruments that allow him to search the sky for objects that came from outside the solar system. It's sort of like a, a person that uh, sits on the sofa at home and says, well, I don't see anyone sitting next to me, therefore I don't have neighbors. Well, guess what? In order to find your neighbors, you have to look through your windows. And uh, moreover, you better use a telescope to find them. Or you might search your backyard for objects that came from the street. Uh, but you can't just sit at home and say, I don't, I don't see anyone, therefore I don't have neighbors. Where is everybody? Because that assumes something, you know, the universe is vast. It's huge in terms of its volume and the resources are limited for any technological civilization. So, you know, you, you might need to make an effort to find the, the evidence. Just think about, you know, the fact that humanity over the past century sent out electromagnetic signals, but mm -hmm. also sent out about five spacecraft that will exit the solar system. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they expand into a vast interstellar space and the chance of each of them, you know, coming close to a specific planet is small. Uh, so we just need to search. Uh, but my point is Albert Einstein was most likely not the smartest scientist who ever lived since the Big Bang, because the Big Bang was 13.8 billion years ago. Uh, we just came at the end of this cosmic play. We know since the days of Galileo that we are not at the center of the stage. Uh, I mean, I can understand why people thought at first that we are the most important things in the universe, because when I looked at my daughters when they were young, they thought that they are the center of the world. Mm -hmm. But then we took them to the kindergarten and they matured. OK, so now we know that uh, a substantial fraction of all the sun like stars have a planet like the Earth, roughly the same separation. Mm -hmm. That fraction is somewhere between a few percent to 100 percent. We we have a large uncertainty in that fraction, but it's substantial. And the point is what we see in our backyard is not unusual. You know, the Earth sun system. That means that the dice of intelligence was rolled, uh, you know, tens of billions of times mm -hmm. just in the Milky Way galaxy. And, and then you have a trillion galaxies like it in the universe, just, you know, the vast numbers imply that we should be modest. You know, there might have been more intelligent beings in our vicinity in the past. Now, it doesn't mean that they exist right now. So if we are trying to have a phone conversation, we wouldn't find them. You know, it's um, if we're trying to detect radio signals, that makes little sense because we had radio communication only over the past century. Yeah. That's a small fraction of the entire lifetime of, of the of the earth. Uh, but what we can look for are relics that they left behind, the uh, crafts that they sent into space. And, you know, it's uh, just like doing interstellar archaeology. And the point about those chemical, uh, chemically propelled spacecraft is that they move at the speed of tens of kilometers per second, less than the escape speed from the Milky Way galaxy. Mm -hmm. So the Milky Way galaxy is just like a basket collecting all of those pieces of equipment, all of those devices 
that were spewed out from the host planet by technological civilizations over the age of the galaxy, 10 billion years. And, you know, we can just search around and look for for any of them. And, you know, we if we try to use our cell phone to have a conversation with Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, we would never be fortunate to speak with Mozart because he's dead by now. But if we, we can, if we search, we can find his musical notes and learn about him. And in much the same way, finding relics of technological civilizations that are dead by now would be very important. And that's the approach to take rather than like Enrico Fermi, you know, saying, where is everybody without even searching and or the SETI community that for seven decades was le- looking for radio signals. That's another approach that is unlikely to find anything. And my point is we should search for objects. And we actually only started to do that over the past decade. We discovered the first three interstellar objects, and we can talk about those three. Yeah, so if we take this uh, notion of, of, let's call it cosmic ar- archaeology or space archaeology, whatever you want to call it, is there any sort of... Um, let's say, very efficient strategies one can think of. And what I mean by that is, for example, is there is there certain places maybe we should look because we think that they could be of special interest for any kind of alien civilization? Or what, where would we expect to find such artifacts? Basically, what we need is to f- identify objects that came into the solar system from outside. And the simplest way to identify them is by the speed that they move. If they move faster than the escape speed from the solar system, then we know that they are not bound gravitationally to the sun. Uh, You know, it's just like launching a rocket fast enough so that it escapes the gravitational pull of the Earth, right? It escapes from the... So if you see an object moving very fast, you know that it was not part of the solar system. It came from outside because, uh, you know, it spends a short amount of time in the solar system and then it leaves it. Uh, And so um, only over the past decade, we had the technology to search for such objects. And it turns out the first one reported was in October 2017. It was an object roughly the size of a football field, about 100 to 200 meters, discovered by a telescope in Hawaii uh, called Panstars. And this telescope was searching for objects near Earth. And it noticed this particular object, but then it Notice also that the object is moving too fast to be bound to the sun. And uh, so the astronomer said, well, it looks like this is the first uh, interstellar object we discovered in our survey. Uh, And it was given the name Oumuamua, which means uh, in the Hawaiian language, a scout. And this object looked really weird because not only, you know, it came from a special frame of reference, which is called the local standard of rest. Mm -hmm. It was basically at rest in the frame of the galaxy nearby, uh, in in, in the local frame of of stars. And uh, the sun just bumped into it because the sun is moving relative to that frame, just like a, a giant ship bumping into a buoy that sits at rest on the surface of the ocean. Uh, And only one in 500 stars is so much at rest in that frame of the local standard of rest. Then uh, the object uh, appeared to be uh, flat, most likely flat, uh, pancake-like, based on the reflection of sunlight. And and then it was pushed away from uh, the sun with some mysterious force without showing any cometary evaporation. So the rocket effect could not have pushed it because we didn't see any cometary tail, no evaporation. But nevertheless, there was something pushing it. And I suggested it was the reflection of sunlight. And for that, the object had to be very thin. And nature doesn't make very thin objects. Uh, when, you, like when, you, when you're saying pushing it, just to be clear, it's it's because it was going too fast than what could be explained just by the um, uh, the orbital mechanics. Alone. Yeah, we, we know uh, Newton's law of gravity and uh, we know the mass of the sun, so we can calculate the orbit of any object moving around the sun. And uh, the people who monitored uh, Oumuamua noticed that it deviates from the trajectory that you expect for an orbit just dictated by the sun's gravity. And it was not passing next to any planet, so you couldn't explain it by an additional force from a planet or anything else. So the question, and this force was declining inversely with distance squared from the sun. And so the question is, what was it? And I suggested it was the reflection of sunlight. Now, there was in 2019, two years later, there was another object that exhibited the same behavior. It was pushed away by reflecting sunlight, no cometary tail. And within a few weeks, 
the astronomers that discovered it on the same telescope in Hawaii realized that it was a rocket booster that was launched in 1966. Yeah. It, it was a thin shell and had very you know large area for its mass, so it was pushed by reflecting sunlight. And obviously, it had no cometary tail because it was an artificial object that we produced. The question is, who produced Oumuamua? And uh, that was the first reported object, but it turns out that in 2014, on January 8th, there was a meteor that was identified by the U.S. government. The U.S. government employs uh, satellites and ground-based uh, sensors to monitor any objects entering the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, it's a national security oh, uh, risk from ballistic missiles that one has to worry about. And uh, and so they noticed this object, but then measured that it moved at 45 kilometers per second uh, uh, when it burned up in wow. the atmosphere at a very low elevation. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, they didn't pay too much attention to it, but together with my student, we figured out that this object came from outside the solar system. If you go back in time, you realize that the speed it had outside the solar system was 60 kilometers per second. And it, it was faster than 95% than of all the stars in the vicinity of the sun. So it was an outlier in terms of its speed. And moreover, from the light curve of the fireball that it created, you can tell that it was tougher than iron. It was actually had a material strength that was uh, stronger than all other meteors in the catalog, 272 of them. So mm -hmm. it was really a, an outlier in terms of material composition, tougher than iron, and uh, in terms of its speed. And it was the first interstellar meteor, roughly the size of a basketball, and it burned up in the atmosphere. And we're planning an expedition to uh, examine the fragments that um, came from that meteor, and we can talk more about that. So yeah. my point, these were the first two interstellar objects that were identified, and both of them were peculiar. Then the third one was a, a, a comet discovered by uh, Gennady Borisov, an amateur astronomer who noticed the cometary tail, and then people looked at it, and it, it looked just like a comet, you know, nothing unusual about it, but it moved fast enough uh, to be unbound to the sun. So mm. what... What we know from the last decade is there, there were three objects detected from in the interstellar space that came into the solar system, and two out of the three are unusual, are uh, anomalous, do not look like the familiar rocks that we found in the solar system before. And to me, it's intriguing. You know, it's just like going to your backyard. You're expecting to see rocks. But then suddenly you see a tennis ball or something that looks very different than the rocks. And you ask yourself, is that an indication that I have neighbors? Yeah. And also, as you said, the first detected ones. But I guess there could, of course, been other ones which we have. Oh, for sure. Detected. I mean, we, we are surveying a very small fraction of the sky for a very uh, small fraction of the time. So... It's, these are just examples, and, and there are many more of them. Uh, just to give you a sense, there are, at any given time, there should be a million, one million uh, objects like this meteor, the size of a basketball, that are within the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. And the, the, we infer that number just because, you know, from the rate by which the Earth collided with, with this meteor, given the amount yeah. of time that we, we searched the sky, okay. the meteors. But the, yeah. the, the, the vast majority, of course, would be um, objects from our solar system. Is there any sort of way we can derive any sort of guess how many extrasolar objects? Yeah, no. See? So what I was what I was talking about is the interstellar ones. Uh, and oh, wow. uh, for every for any object from the interstellar space, there are a thousand objects from the solar system. So mm -hmm. the ratio is roughly a thousand to one. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but there are still uh, a lot of them. Now, one thing to keep in mind is if there are two types of interstellar objects, there are, there are those that uh, would look like space trash that are not functional anymore. You know, just imagine New Horizons or Voyager or Pioneer, the type of spacecraft that we launched in a million years from now or a billion years from now, they will not be functional. They will be just space trash. And they could, uh, you know, come close to a 
an exoplanet, they might even collide with it and look like a meteor and land on, on, in the ocean of that exoplanet, but they would not be functional. And then there, there, there is another class of uh, objects that you can imagine being functional that have, for example, artificial intelligence, and they are guided to visit the habitable regions around stars, the regions that are of interest for life. And if you just visit the habitable region around the sun, for example, that region uh, has a volume that is 10 to the power 16 or 15 smaller than the, the volume of the solar system as a whole. Hmm. So if you are sending probes that are directed at that small volume, then near Earth, you would find many more of them. Mm-hmm. And you expect for a random population. The random population would need to be 10 to the power 16 more abundant for some of them to be in the region where the Earth moves around the sun, whereas a directional uh, probe, uh, you know, would visit just that region. So uh, my point is, when we conclude what is the abundance of such objects in interstellar space, that depends very much on whether we are talking about functional objects that are mm-hmm. directed in into the habitable zone versus objects that move on some random orbit. For the potential functional uh, objects, I mean, do do you think, do you consider Earth a place worth visiting for for somebody who's not from Earth? Well, knowing what I find on Earth, I would uh, say (laughs) not necessarily so. I mean, one reason I'm seeking intelligence in space is because I don't often find it here on Earth. Um, And, uh, you know, if you look at human history, it's full of mistakes. And most of them were triggered by arrogance, by the human ego, by a group of people trying to feel superior relative to other groups of people. But if you think about the big picture, you know, it's very likely that there is a smarter kid on our cosmic block, that there is another civilization that is much, much more advanced than we are. There is a huge technological gap between us and them. Once we realize that, then the differences between us humans would appear meaningless. And all of these attempts to feel superior relative to other humans would look ridiculous. I hope that if we find those civilizations, it will give us a sense of modesty uh, to treat each other uh, as equal members of the human species and to try and learn from those smarter kids on our block. Yeah, I mean, those smarter kids, I guess, could consider us, I mean, this is a stereotypical comparison, why there's some sort of insects or something. This, again, comes back to the question, would they would they actually care unless maybe they think that Earth has some you know, interesting resource or we're producing something interesting in the same way that we care about honeybees because uh, partly because they produce honey and right i mean it really depends what they're seeking and we cannot guess that because you know we might be just like ants on a sidewalk if a biker comes by the ants may decide about a protocol how to engage with a biker but first of all the biker would not would care less about which crack in the pavement is being occupied by a colony of ants. So obviously, you know, the biker would not care about national borders. And, you know, governments care just about national borders. They care about national security uh, against adversaries and so forth. So, you know, if government, I mean, it's sort of natural that the government is the first one to notice something unusual in the sky because astronomers are looking at very great distances. If something flies above their telescope, they simply ignore it. But governments are motivated by very different ideas about them, you know, maintaining national security and so forth. And uh, this is really a scientific matter. And my point is, whatever the ants decide to do is completely irrelevant from the point of view of Mm. the biker. But what we can do, you know, at first is try to get as much data as possible and uh, monitor those gadgets that we see in the sky. Most likely, if they're functional, they're operated by artificial intelligence. They might even have 3D printers that allow them to repair themselves to maybe even reproduce We don't know, but uh, it's unlikely, in my opinion, that we will find biological creatures visiting Mm. us. It will be most likely, you know, advanced forms of AI. Uh, And, you know, instead of second guessing, we should just monitor what they're doing, what kind of information they're seeking, those devices. And by the way, um, you know, even though I'm a physicist, uh, astronomer, if indeed we meet AI 
systems or AI astronauts, I think uh, psychologists would be better equipped to try and interpret them because, you know, artificial intelligence could be at some level a- an advanced version of human intelligence and Dealing with human intelligence from the point of view of physics is really not the right approach. You know, you can't just solve Schrodinger's equation and figure out what a human will do. Psychologists, you know, it's a very complex system. So psychologists are trying to understand the human behavior and second guess what humans might do under different circumstances. They have the tools of analyzing uh, intelligent behavior. and, um, And so if we ever meet Uh, devices that are intelligent, I think psychologists would be better equipped at analyzing what they might be seeking. Right. In terms of ever since Oumuamua and then in Borisov, are we now at least looking more for these objects? I'm looking more for these objects. (laughs) I established the Galileo project uh, and uh, that's the stated goal of the project to basically uh, rendezvous with the next Oumuamua that uh, could be identified by the Vera Rubin Observatory that will start operations in Chile uh, within a year. That will be our dating app. Mm -hmm. Um, Most of the time we will swipe to the left, but we might uh, decide to rendezvous with one of these objects. And that would be an expensive mission. The second uh, track of the Galileo project is to monitor unidentified objects in the sky that Mm -hmm. the U.S. government is talking about. These are UAP and try and figure out their nature because the government is unable to tell us what they are. And then the third uh, track of the Galileo project is um, an expedition to Papua New Guinea to Uh, collect the fragments of this first interstellar meteor from 2014 that I mentioned before. Yeah. So let, let's take this in turn. So uh, UAP is something I was going to ask you about anyway. So there seems to be something interesting going on that some people perceive. And so, so Pippa Morgan was on the podcast a few weeks ago, and she mentioned this, that um, so people talking about, well, UFOs, what people previously called UFOs are now more commonly referred to as UAPs. Um, in the past, you were very quickly sort of ridiculed, sidelined, ignored uh, when you started talking about that. Now we seem to be having congressional hearings and um, official documentation about it. So there seems to be some sort of shift that's happening at some levels of the government. Is that Are you perceiving that as well? And then the next question would be so also in line of what we talked about academia in the beginning of the of the episode. Has that in any way affected um, the academic world yet that maybe researching this type of stuff is becoming more acceptable than, than it was? Well, the thing to keep in mind is that it may be a mixed bag. You know, people mm. talked about it in the past, but, you know, they may have talked most of the time about things that the military was using, that the citizens were not aware of. Uh, They were talking about things that were illusions, optical illusions. Most of the reports were based on eyewitnesses and uninformed eyewitnesses or relatively mediocre pieces of equipment that were recording Mm -hmm. things like cell phones that always give you blurry images. However, what really changed in recent years is the fact that we have now the technology to get much better data and the government is monitoring the sky. That's their day job, okay? They have to figure out if there are objects, unauthorized objects moving in the sky. So that's their day job. And in the process of doing that, they see things they don't understand. And, you know, if they were to see things that belong, could belong to another nation, they would not talk about it publicly Mm. because it would be embarrassing for them to admit that there is another nation invading the airspace of, for example, the U.S., and that they are not able to cope with it. They would never make it public. They would try to resolve this issue internally and respond to it. That's like any other Mm. national security threat. You have to deal with it. That's your day job. You are being paid to do that. Okay. Now, instead, they come to Congress and talk about it as if they don't really know what these things are. So that to me is interesting. Now, most of this data is classified. Uh, Waiting for it to be declassified is like waiting for Godot in the Mm -hmm. play of Samuel Beckett. Uh, It will never happen. So, uh, and the reason is simple. The government has sensors that uh, they don't want adversaries to be aware of. So they will never release the data just because it was collected by classified sensor. The sky itself is not classified. So that's why in the Galileo project, we'll have open data of the sky and mm-hmm. allow anyone to look at it. But but to me, it's intriguing that there are very senior 
officials within government talking about this subject seriously because it implies that you know if there is uh, some smoke the there might be fire and uh, and therefore this subject needs to be addressed by uh, scientifically you know the the government is not a scientific organization we'll try to clear up the fog uh, at the moment it's just that you know i would love to see the classified data but it would never become unclassified and uh, the way science operates is by reproducibility of results and you want the data to be open, available. So that's what we are aiming to do. Yeah. So talking about the way you are now observing the skies, I mean, how do you feel about our current sort of status of, of technology? So I haven't looked at this in detail. I'm just seeing sort of anecdotally, you know, things like um, fairly recently, there was a rocket stage about to hit the moon. And we seem to detect that relatively late and had no idea what it was and where it came from. And um, so I was like, well, our, you know, in space situational awareness doesn't seem to be that great yet. A totally different example. Um, I know you're involved in uh, a project Starshot as well, right? And I once asked, actually, on this podcast, I asked Pete Worden, like, you know, if there was an inverse project Starshot, like if there is, you know, civilization on on uh, Alpha Cent in the Alpha Centauri system, and they sent the inverse thing to Earth, would we likely detect it when it flies by? And oh, I, I, I actually looked into that. I did the calculation. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to uh, ask you for your answer as well, because Pete basically was like, oh, you probably wouldn't detect it. <laughs> no, 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 we would never detect it. And this, uh, you know, first of all, astronomers, when I talked about the possibility that Oumuamua might be artificial in origin, I was immediately attacked. And, and people said, that makes no sense. It's It must be natural, period. There was even a review paper in a, a prestigious magazine, Nature Astronomy, mm -hmm. saying, it's natural. Forget about it. That's it. It's natural. Let's move on. And then a few months later, a group of astronomers said, well, to explain its properties, we need to argue that maybe it was a hydrogen iceberg because mm -hmm. we didn't see the cometary tail and hydrogen is transparent. So, uh, you know, we really need to assume that it's an object of a type that we've never seen before because we don't know if nature makes hydrogen icebergs. We've never mm -hmm. seen something like that. It has to be made in molecular clouds. Then it turns out that hydrogen icebergs evaporate very quickly, so it wouldn't survive the journey. So they said, oh, okay, maybe something else. So then another team came and said, oh, it may be a, a, a cloud of dust particles that is 100 times less dense than air, a dust bunny. Uh, well, but then the problem is that when it gets close to the sun, it will be heated by hundreds of degrees and will disintegrate. Mm. So then a few months later, another team said, oh, oh, actually, you know what? It was a nitrogen iceberg. And everyone said, yeah, nitrogen iceberg and cheered. And then the problem, you know, the idea was it was a chip uh, from a surface of a planet like Pluto. Uh, mm. But then you don't have enough solid nitrogen uh, to produce a large enough population of chips such that one of them would be Oumuamua. And my point is, how is it possible that there was a first paper, review paper, saying it is natural, and then you had to come through three iterations of possible explanations, none of which is with, you know, like straightforward, and all of them have issues, and we've never seen any object of these three types before. So how can you argue very forcefully that it must be natural before you even come with hydrogen iceberg, nitrogen iceberg, or dust bunny? And it's just the, the desire of people to say there is nothing new. Everything is according to what we already knew before, even though we didn't see it, anything like that. And, you know, it's the approach that a cave dweller would take towards finding a cell phone. The cave dweller would say, oh, it's a rock of a type that I've never seen before. Mm. But then, you know, if you press a button, you would realize it records your voice, press another button, records your image. The more evidence you get about this rock of a type that we've never seen before, the more you would be convinced that uh, it is not a rock. The point is, if you decide ahead of time that it must be a rock, and that the details are irrelevant, you would never figure out something new. And that's the tendency of experts. They want to pretend that their past knowledge can represent anything we find. You know, that suppresses discovering something new or innovation. And um, obviously, it will not flatter their ego if we were to discover a device, a gadget that is technological, but they are used finding rocks in the sky. So they would say anything in the sky is a rock. And then it doesn't look like a rock we've seen. So, well, it's a rock made of hydrogen. Well, it's a rock made of nitrogen. Well, it's actually a dust bunny. They don't care. They will just try to find something uh, of that nature. And my point is, that is not 
<laughs> a sincere approach uh, that is being guided by childhood curiosity. Let's forget about our ego. Let's forget about who is expert, who is not. Let's just figure out what these things are. And the only way to figure out is by seeking more evidence. But if you tell yourself you know the answer in advance, you will never find that evidence. Yeah. So talking about speaking evidence, let's talk about your proposed expedition to the to the ocean floor. Can you quickly summarize what, what you guys are trying to achieve there? Right. So this meteor, the first interstellar object ever discovered that, that we identified with my student, Amir Siraj, uh, exploded about 18.7 kilometers above the, the ocean surface. And the, it was about 100 miles off the coast of Papua New Guinea. And the fragments from the explosion uh, were dispersed in that region. And th this explosion released a few percent of the energy of the Hiroshima atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. um, and what we hope to do is uh, scoop the ocean floor with a, a sled and a magnet and a net and look for the fragments left behind from that meteor. And obviously, the reason we do that is because it was an outlier. As I mentioned, this meteor was moving faster than 95% of all the stars in the vicinity of the sun and also had material strength uh, that is tougher than 99.7% of all the meteors. So it was extremely tough and moved fast. And that raises the possibility that maybe it was artificial in origin. So we want to examine the composition of those fragments and tell the difference between an iron meteorite or a, a stony meteorite and a, an artificial alloy. And um, so we, uh, I just got uh, funded for this expedition. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, again, it was from the private sector, wealthy individuals that were inspired by the mission and uh, heard me speak on various podcasts, uh, approached me. I didn't do. I didn't go out to uh, specific individuals, but they they approached me and they said that is exciting. We really want you know to see what you would find, and uh, so we are going. We we are starting the planning phase now, and it's going to happen uh, uh, within the coming months. And um, uh, and then uh, the, whatever we find will be available to the science community at large. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I was approached by a number of people that wanted to offer uh, uh, support for, for the ex ex expedition. Uh, they had commercial interests. And mm -hmm. I said, this is scientific, purely scientific, no strings attached. We want to make the findings available to any for anyone to look at. Uh, and I refuse to make to commercialize it, uh, make any profit from it. Uh, we will put whatever fragments we find, we'll put it either in a museum or uh, at Harvard University available to the entire scientific community. And um, you know, stay tuned. And, you know, if we do find a gadget <laughs> that survived the impact and it has some buttons, uh, I would love to press one of them. Uh, I, I actually got an email from someone who was concerned and said, that, please don't don't press any buttons because it may risk all of us. And I said, don't worry. I, will. I was just joking about pressing a button. <laughs> yeah, maybe you press the button and then obviously it's like an alien version of Twitter or something. <laughs> it would be very depressing. Well, ju just imagine uh, finding iPhone 100, you know, the 100 version of the iPhone, not number 13, 14. That would be a dramatic innovation. And obviously there would be people, you know, in Silicon Valley that would love to see it. Yes, yes. And so uh, so now, now that you have the funding, what uh, when did you say this um, expedition might start? Uh, well, that depends uh, on details. We are now um, uh, clearing them up. Uh, my guess is it's in the first quarter of 2023. Okay. And you said, uh, you mentioned magnets. So I assume there's sort of a high certainty that this is a metallic object of some sorts? No. That, that Well, obviously it will be uh, fortunate if that's the case. Um, the mm -hmm. fact that it's tougher than iron uh, perhaps implies metallic origin, but it could also be not unmagnetized material. And we have a plan B of collecting fragments that are not magnetized as well. Understood. And do you have any notion sort of how big the area is that you will have to search? Yeah, well, as of now, it's um, 10 kilometers on a side. That's a big area. That's a big, that, that's a very big but area. But we, we hope to narrow it down with better analysis. Okay, understood. But speaking of speaking of such projects, if you had, let's call it uh, for practical purposes, unlimited funding, whatever that means, 
tens of billions, hundreds of billions. What, what would be some projects that you think we should be engaging in? Oh, I think we should uh, ramp up uh, surveys of the sky. So that could include objects uh, within the Earth atmosphere. These are the unidentified aerial phenomena the government is talking about, just figuring out what they are, you know, if, whether they're human-made, natural, or something else. Okay, so for that... You know, what we are currently developing in the Galileo project, you know, we have the first suite of instruments that is about $250,000 in cost. And then obviously we can put it in one location, but we want to make copies of it. And, you know, if we had uh, $100 million, we could make enough copies to basically get to the bottom of this question of what are UAP, okay? Mm -hmm. At the level of $100 million, that's, even though it sounds like a significant amount, it's not a lot um, for a major scientific project. You know, the Large Hadron Collider was was $10 billion. The Webb telescope was $10 billion. And if you think about the Large Hadron Collider, you know, obviously discovered the Higgs boson, but not much beyond that. And uh, we were hoping to learn about the nature of dark matter by finding the lightest supersymmetric particle. That didn't happen. Okay, mm. so we invested $10 billion, didn't find anything bef uh, beyond the old news from the 1960s that there is a Higgs boson. That's old news. And my point is that at an expense of 1% of the Large Hadron Collider, we can pretty much figure out the nature of UAP. That, that's based on, uh, on uh, you know, a, a very detailed design of the instruments we need in the Galileo project. So that's 1% of the biggest science projects. It's not a lot. Um, yeah. And then, uh, well, if we had the level of billions, then that includes space missions to rendezvous with objects like Oumuamua. So that's that's at the level of a, of a billion or more. Uh, any space mission to come close to a big, you know, to an object that came from outside the solar system would cost more than a billion dollars. So then you can start planning sending such missions. And of course, you can even imagine landing on an object if it looks especially artificial. You know, that would be amazing because uh, we can learn much more about it. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. In my case, it's worth 66,000 words, the number of words in my book, mm -hmm. uh, Extraterrestrial. And, uh, you know, I would much rather publish a photo album. Uh, that's easy. You just take a snap, a few photos, publish them instead of writing a whole book about what Oumuamua might be and why is it anomalous, you know. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, getting better data, getting images with high resolution uh, is, you know, a shortcut to getting to the truth, to the bottom of what these things are. And once we have such an image, nobody would argue, oh, it's a nitrogen iceberg. It's a, you know, the image would show if it's a nitrogen iceberg, we'll be able to tell easily, okay? And if it's a hydrogen iceberg or a dust bunny, so let's just get that image. And, um, you know, so any mission in space of this magnitude would imply more than a billion dollars. So that having a, a budget of billions of dollars would allow us to go into space. Otherwise, uh, searches for meteors that came from interstellar space, they are a thousand times less expensive. We're talking about millions instead of billions. Yeah. And then, and then if we're unlucky, we'll figure out it actually was a camouflaged um, alien military vessel camouflaged as a hydrogen iceberg. <laughs> we have bad luck. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, um, you know, that would be interesting by itself because you, you can imagine hydrogen. I actually wrote a paper about it using hydrogen as a fuel. You know, it's a very efficient fuel. So if you use a hydrogen as a fuel, of course, it will be invisible. You can imagine a rocket that is being propelled by hydrogen rather than the standard chemical propellants that we use. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you mentioned, um, and we're kind of coming towards the end here because it's um, running out of time, but you mentioned the James Webb Telescope, which obviously, and then you mentioned the power of images, um, part of the James Webb Telescope, part of the point is that it will hopefully provide us with lots of powerful images. Is there something you are particularly looking for, excited about, of what the James Webb Space Telescope might provide yeah, us? Yeah, so the Webb Telescope is uh, 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth. And um, as a result, if there is an object like Oumuamua that comes uh, close to Earth, uh, it will view it from a different direction than the Earth-based telescopes. And it's just like having two, pair, two eyes. You know, the, the reason we have two eyes is because they allow us uh, to assess the distance 
of mm -hmm. an object. And that was important for us as animals, you know, uh, alerting ourselves for a threat. You know, if we saw uh, a lion approaching us, we could tell how far it is and respond accordingly. So that's why animals with two eyes survive better than animals with one eye. And uh, having the web telescope, in addition to ground-based uh, telescopes on Earth, would allow us to see the object from different directions and infer the distance and sort of the three-dimensional trajectory to a very high precision. Uh, and we can tell whether it's uh, propelled uh, by some other force, whether there is anything that is pushing it uh, beyond the force of gravity. And um, that would be fantastic, much better than the data we had before Webb was launched. And the Webb telescope can also look at the infrared emission from this object, the actual thermal emission when, you know, the object is warmed up by sunlight and we can infer something about the composition of the surface of the object. So there's a lot to be learned from uh, data coming from the Webb telescope. So usually at the end of this podcast, um, my standard question is to ask people about uh, favorite science fiction, but I had listened to um, your podcast episode with Lex Friedman and you made it very clear that you don't like science fiction a lot because it's not, um, let's call it scientifically hard enough. Well, it was uh, <laughs> funny because uh, after that podcast, uh, you know, about uh, nine months later, um, in November 2021, I was uh, attending a forum at the Washington National Cathedral mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Jeff Bezos was on stage and he was saying, saying that uh, his uh, space aspirations uh, evolved as a result of him watching Star Trek as a kid. Mm -hmm. that inspired him. So I was telling uh, Avril Haynes, the director of national intelligence, who was sitting next to me, I told her, you know, I was never impressed by science fiction, by Star Trek. I, I didn't like it. And she said, we have to work on you, Avi. <laughs> I, can, I can join that group. Um, but that's actually a nice segue into the question that I decided I would ask as a substitute question for the science, for, uh, the science fiction question, which is, We talked about education at the beginning, and you also mentioned the sort of like the, the wonderfulness of childlike curiosity. Any sort of advice, including for parents of young kids like me, how can we get our kids excited about astronomy, but also even more generally speaking, how can we make sure they keep their childlike curiosity and don't get bogged down into some of these things that we discussed in the context of the current academic world? Well, it's very simple. When they ask a difficult question to which you don't know the answer, don't pretend that you know the answer. Don't uh, tell them, forget about this, you know, this is a ridiculous question, let's move to something else, which is very often what adults do because they feel embarrassed to admit that they don't know the answer, okay? So just be sincere. Uh, very often kids lose their curiosity because the adults suppress it. The adults are telling them, oh, this is a silly question just because they don't know the answer to it. Or the adults tell them, invent some story around the answer to the question that is incorrect. And if instead the adults would admit they don't know the answer, it's very interesting, let's find out, uh, then that would maintain the childhood curiosity. And the problem is that as we educate the kids to ignore questions to which we don't know the answer or to pretend that we know the answer, you end up with scientists that write a review paper to Nature Astronomy magazine and say, Oumuamua is a natural object, period. And they don't know that it's natural, but they just say that, okay? That's just like parents telling their kids, you know, it's, I know what it is, forget about it. And, and the answer that you give is, does not represent any knowledge. Because the reason I say that is because other scientists then a few months later come up with explanations of something that we've never seen before. Three times, hydrogen icebergs, dust bunny, nitrogen iceberg. And how is that possible that they would need to publish papers? You know, it's very uh, tedious to write a paper. It takes months then to go through the review process and publish it. Why would three teams work on this and admit that the properties of a muamua do not represent something that we know when the original review paper was saying it's natural? So my point is not sincere. And that is just like adults very often respond to questions from kids. And I say, that's the problem, you know, that we pretend to know more than we know. And it's all driven by our ego, by our arrogance. And if we leave the ego behind and just say, let's follow the evidence, here is something strange, let's figure it out. You know, kids very often when they see an object, 
They go to the object, turn it around, try to figure it out. The adult would sit on the sofa and say, ah, I pretty much know what this object is. I don't want to waste energy and time to go to the object and touch it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that is the difference because when the kid goes to the object, the kid might discover something new about it. And in order not to suppress it, you just need to tell your kid, go ahead, figure it out. I don't know what it is rather than, oh, don't worry about it. I can't think of a better way of, of really wrapping this up, this, this notion of basically uncompromising childlike search of the truth and, and in that vein, Avi, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. And we're really looking forward to, to your ocean expedition and, and the results it might bring. Thank you. I will definitely be happy to report back when, when we find out what, what this is. Thanks. And that's a wrap for another nominal episode of the Space Business Podcast. Once more, if you enjoyed this, please leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, such as Apple or Spotify. You can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore space. You can support us at www.patreon.com forward slash space business podcast lastly if you have any feedback including ideas for guests and that may include yourself if you have an interesting space story to tell or interested in being a sponsor drop us an email at spacebusinesspodcast at gmail.com see you for the next episode